What's up, everybody? This is Jeremy McClellan, and welcome to the very first episode of Holy Wars, a podcast about religion, coexistence, and all the people who are trying to figure it out. Over the past several years, I've traveled all over the world performing in mosques and churches, big theaters, dive bars, small towns in the South, big cities in Pakistan, and along the way, I've met so many amazing people, comedians, religious scholars, academics, activists, student organizers, politicians, you name it. And I would end up having these long conversations about religion, particularly the relationship between Christianity and Islam. And these were conversations and perspectives that I just didn't see happening anywhere else. So I made Holy Wars, which is my attempt at bringing all these voices together in conversation to try to figure this out before we all kill each other. It's a pretty good goal. Uh, and I was trying to figure out who I wanted to be my first guest, because uh, I had a lot of people to pick from. And then New Zealand happened. A uh, white supremacist killed 50 Muslims in two mosques, and his motivation was this idea of the Great Replacement, this fear that Christian civilization was being replaced with Islam, that Muslims were invaders, that the white race was dying out, and only bloodshed was going to solve it. And it was this perfect microcosm of all of these discussions that I had been having over the years. And then I read an article by someone who I had been following for a while, a journalist at The Intercept, Murtaza Hussein, who read the terrorist manifesto and deconstructed this idea, and also showed how this fear was not some fringe theory, but really is the animating force behind so many populist movements in the West. And for me, like I think as faith and liberalism declines, the need for a post-liberal model for pluralism remains more important now than ever. So I asked Murderza to come on the show. Uh, I hope you enjoy this episode and all of our future episodes. Remember to follow Holy Wars, subscribe, support my Patreon, and please reach out with any feedback you may have. Thank you, and welcome to Holy Wars. Murderza, thank you for joining us. How's it going? I'm doing well, thank you. Cool. Uh, now, just for any listeners who are confused, uh, you are not Murderza Hussein, the cricketer, right? There's a uh, yeah. <laughs> Search me on Google. My previous cricket career when I was also older yeah. comes up. It's, uh, I've left that reality behind. Okay. Are you, are you a fan of cricket? Do you watch it? Uh, you know what? No. I When <laughs> I was a kid, my dad really tried to get me involved in it. I took the baseball for many years, but then uh, somehow I left, was not able to stick with it. My uh, my best friend, Sultan, uh, he's he's from near Lahore in, in, in Pakistan. And his uh, when he was little, he has this very vivid memory of being at an event where Imran Khan was like the guest um, just over at someone's house and was given like a cricket bat by Imran Khan and then proceeded to go outside and like hit it like against a rock or something and break it in half. <laughs> and but he has this like horrified now he's horrified thinking back on that but uh back then he was just you know some little kid who had no idea who he was who he was d disgracing at the time oh that could have been a uh, piece of valuable memorabilia well it even even more valuable if he had kept it and it, it had been broken or something it would have been a good story uh just frame it or something this is me breaking Imran Khan's cricket bat but uh so you're in New York City right now I am, yes. Okay, cool. But you're from the Toronto area, like, or Toronto proper? Yeah, no, I grew up in and around Toronto. Okay. Uh, and I was born in Pakistan. Okay. But then I've lived here for some where, years. Where, where, where in Pakistan were you born? I was born in Karachi. Okay. I have not been to Karachi. I've been to Lahore and Islamabad. I'm going back uh, to Karachi in a few months, hopefully. Um, but uh, I, everyone in Karachi was very angry with me uh, when I announced I was going to Pakistan a year ago and then only went to Islamabad and Lahore. And so it was very, <laughs> it was a very touchy issue. I have, a, uh, I have a strange relationship with people from Karachi, but hopefully that'll be smoothed over in a few weeks. Karachi is a crazy place. It's definitely a lot more intense than Islamabad and Lahore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the modern city of uh, Pakistan, you could say. If you want to go to experience a lot of modernity uh, or Pakistani or South Asian uh, take on that, that would be the place. Mm. Uh, it's definitely a crazy time. Awesome. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I wanted to talk with you. I've, I've been following your, you know, obviously you on Twitter, but also reading your work um, in, at The Intercept um, and, and, and elsewhere for quite a while. I wanted to talk with you about an article that you wrote um, and also some other stuff you've written, um, particularly on the... 
uh, the manifesto that the New Zealand shooter um, wrote. And uh, w- one of the reasons why I wanted this to be the first podcast in my um, uh, that, that, that we record for this, for Holy Wars, is because it's a great, I guess, microcosm of this larger debate and larger, uh, I guess, conspiracy, larger clash that people are... Um, uh, that we seem to be hearing more and more about um, every day. And so uh, it, for those, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the world has heard about this shooting, but basically there was a um, white nationalist from Australia who went to New Zealand and uh, shot, um, I think, 50 people total. It was 49 uh, for a while, and then it, it was 50 um, at, at two different mosques. And uh, he, it was unusual for a number of reasons. Number one, um, because it was live streamed. He live streamed the whole thing on a camera, but also he wrote this giant manifesto, um, which clearly spelled out exactly why he did it. Um, although it was also full of a lot of irony. And so, um, when the same thing, Horace, so I'm, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where I live right now. That's where I'm calling you from. And we had a similar thing happen here um, several years ago when Dylan Roof shot um, uh, several um, or many, many um, African-Americans in a church downtown, um, including uh, one guy, Tawanza, who was a friend of mine. And he wrote a manifesto as well. And at the time, there was this debate about whether to read it, well, you know, what could be gained by reading it? Should it just be ignored? I know that New Zealand banned it. Um, why do you think that we should actually pay attention to what he wrote? You know, uh, my initial inclination was to not read it. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, you know, you know, uh, there are personal reasons sometimes. And the natural human inclination, I think, is when something is very disturbing to try to minimize it or rationalize it or pay as little attention as you can while still continuing with your normal life. So had I not been a journalist, I probably, as an ordinary person, would have not read it uh, because, uh, you know, that's just, I think that's a very normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. I felt that I had a responsibility as a journalist to read it. Um, And prior to this, I've spent a lot of time reading the documentation produced by extremist groups from different religions and different political movements. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand and take seriously. We tend to have a, uh, we have an inclination to, dismiss things out of the norm or very violently out of the norm as somehow being uh, expression of madness. I think in reality, uh, these people oftentimes are not crazy at all. They're offering, arguing something which is disturbing and I would say evil, Mm -hmm. especially in its consequences, but it's uh, rational in its own way and it's important to understand it and take it seriously. And upon reading it, you know, I was disturbed by the shooting, obviously, for the obvious reasons. Uh, it was live stream. It was just a horrible act of murder in a, a place of uh, worship. But when I read it, I was far more disturbed, actually, because I did find this to be a completely sober, albeit evil, document that expressed a worldview which cannot simply be dismissed as crazy, but has to be engaged mm. much more deeply. Mm. You know, it reminds me of... Um there was a uh, there was a guy in my denomination growing up. Um, I I became Catholic later on, but um, I was raised uh, Reformed Presbyterian. And there was an elder in our circles. I never met him. My parents never met him. But he uh, he was one of the guys who he he was a pastor, and he assassinated an, an abortion doctor, and mm-hmm. he uh, ended up getting death row, and he's he's been executed by now. Um, but he wrote a very long thing about it. And when you read it, it's not crazy. It's logical. There's a logic to it. And you hear that logic being repeated elsewhere. And so with the, uh, the manifesto that, that you wrote about, and we'll include it in all of the links when we, um, you know, release the podcast for our readers, uh, to, to, or for our listeners to, to read up on, um, what was his, uh, his main, um, motivation that he stated that you uh, that, that you talk about 
Yeah, so the manifesto runs to almost about 80 pages. And notably, in that manifesto, he makes clear that he's influenced by Dylan Roof and Anders Breivik, and he's read what they wrote. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an ecosystem, even if we or the general public uh, is more comfortable dismissing it, there's an ecosystem of people who are reading and taking it seriously. And I think that there's a consistent message that there's a sense of racial paranoia and I would say pessimism bordering, bordering on apocalyptic pessimism. Mm. Uh, he, in the manifesto, he starts off actually with repeating the same phrase three times just so you know he gets the, you get the point, which is, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates, mm -hmm. it's the birth rates. He's extremely concerned that white people, uh, the category that he describes, but does not uh, define uh, very succinctly because it's a very amorphous category. Uh, he is concerned that there are being less white people in the world, uh, other groups of people, including but not exclusive to Muslims, who he describe, describe, defines as non-white, mm -hmm. are breeding at a faster rate, having more children, uh, they have more robust cultures with higher degrees of trust, and given the collapse of, uh, he laments the collapse of Christianity in the manifesto, although he's not able to really identify himself as a Christian, because right. uh, he has sort of a nihilistic uh, set of beliefs, he is concerned that this will lead to the extinction of his people. And as he goes through the manifesto, he is actually Australian, but he spent a lot of time traveling around the world. And for him, as he described it, the emotional breaking point came when he was in France. Mm. And when he was in France, he was so overcome by seeing non-white people who he describes as invaders in France that he actually broke down in tears and he realized that something must be done. And sometime after that, he came to the realization, mm. or as for his own beliefs, that a violence some act of violence is necessary to galvanize a broader social collapse after which hopefully uh, white people will regenerate themselves uh, as a virile racial force. Yeah, so this is a sort of accelerationism where he's planning to uh, put his finger on these cracks and expose it and then hopefully, you know, accelerate the process where white people, I guess, finally wake up and realize what's going on and then take their country back or take take their race back, I suppose. Yeah, and this is exactly what the, how you describe the tactic, which is accelerationism of trying to exacerbate the contradictions as he sees them in society and lead society to collapse completely so that hopefully something better can be built in its wake. And I, I think that what I got gleaned from his, his uh, manifesto is that, and I think it's something, a very common belief, disturbingly common today, among, including among people who would never dream of engaging in violence or who were, uh, abhor his act or acts such as this, that there is a very broad current of nihilism uh, mm. in the general public today. This is a nihilistic belief. He didn't have, he saw the world as it pleasant, presently constituted as so destroyed and so irredeemable and so hopeless that the only thing that maybe could make it better is committing an act of mass murder. Mm -hmm. And of course, most people don't think that mass murder is going to make things better, but I think that he's drawing on a very deep well of disenchantment uh, and a lack of meaning and purpose that people have, that they look at a world which is very bleak and they want to reject everything, but they don't necessarily have a clear idea of what they'd like to replace that everything with. And they also fail to understand that Every era has challenges. Every era has things you prefer to be better. Uh, we and our complex societies, which you built, they're very fragile. And it's not very clear that if you would accelerate and destroy them, that something better would come. Right. It's much more likely something much worse would come. Yeah, there's a great um, there's there's a great book um, that uh, I, I I really like. It's by a guy named Gauss. Um, I forget the title, but one of the things he talks about is about is uh, is that we. If you if you if you think of justice as um, getting as high as possible, like we're currently on a mountain, 
and we can keep trying to climb the mountain that we're on. Um, or we can, and that's sort of the, the people who are just trying to make society better. Um, and, or there are people who are like, well, no, there's a higher mountain uh, that we can get on and we, we, can, you know, we, like, we, we, we can go even further up there. Um, but the problem is, is that you have to go down <laughs> uh, in order to get onto that mountain. So let's say you want to switch from the system we have now to uh, you know, Catholic monarchy or you know, anarcho-capitalism or whatever kind of ideal you have. Um, like it's not at all clear that you can ever get to the other mountain. Like most of the time when you go down and you get into the valley, you just stay there in the valley for a very long time. Uh, and um, I, I sort of get that sense where it's like, okay, first we're going to cause everything to collapse and then something wonderful will come out of it. Like, well, maybe not. Maybe things just stay bad. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that there's a sense and I'm not immune to it of people, there's a romanticization of revolutionary change. Mm. And, and there are some circumstances where revolutions are not necessarily chosen, but they just kind of happen because society has been so abused that it collapses of its own volition. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there's a brief opportunity to make it better, but then there's always a lot of complications. But I think if you look at history, most revolutions or most attempts at a radical change in a very short time, they end up making things worse. Mm -hmm. and it's really incremental, unglamorous change over a long period that leads us up a mountain of, that's worth being on top of. Yeah, yeah. Now, going back to the whole nihilism, there was a guy, Ben Sixsmith, who writes for, I think, The Spectator or something, but he called it, he called it irony poisoning, uh, mm -hmm. that, the, that sort of uh, there's this blend of nihilism and ideology uh, that... Um, I mean, especially this, uh, this kind of attack or, the, you know, the New Zealand manifesto, which was just so full of like inside jokes and, uh, you know, um, he was, he was referencing things into like online culture and he told people to like subscribe to PewDiePie. And it was, it was this very strange sort of meta, meta, meta thing that, but then also murdering, you know, tons and tons of people. So I definitely, uh, and, and you can feel it like on Twitter, right? Like, you know, just there's all of this uh, kind of um, absurdism and uh, irony that sometimes you just end up not knowing what you believe anymore or not knowing what matters. Um, right. I don't know. It's, it's a very strange place to be. You know, uh, I, I found that he really speaks the shooter, he really, in his manifesto, and in, including the video when he talks about PewDiePie, etc., he really is speaking in the register of time. And I think that irony, it can be a useful device for comedy or, uh, you know, to make a literary point. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes the most common mode of uh, expression or, you know, if it's not and a companion to something more solid, a set of beliefs or a metaphysical um, sense of being or looking at the world, I think it can really be a mask for a great void. Mm. And that void can be filled with all types of things. And more often than not, it might be filled with things that are very bad. Mm. And I think that, you know, for the last several years and in the last decade and a half with this information revolution, we've been exposed to a much broader range of voices than we're typically used to. Before, mm -hmm. in industrial society, we're used to a few major news outlets and TV stations, and you can probably count the number of journalists that are out there or a number of commentators. You have the people around you in your life, in your networks and so forth. But now there's such a cacophony of voices, and a lot of the voices we hear you know, irony, like that's like a default mode of expression. There's a lot of anger, a lot of angst and uh, searching, and there's a lot of uh, bile and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, toxicity as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that the first time I started realizing this is really real, I think it started becoming real, you know, the political upheavals in the early 2010s and Occupy and the Tea Party and the Arab Spring. But then, you know, there's always also these, uh, the online Nazis, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, uh, that, that trend. 
And then when that shooting happened in Pittsburgh last year, mm. and the guy who did the shooting at the synagogue, he was echoing exactly the sort of things that you know people were complaining about hearing on social media about you know theories of uh, racial replacement, very much like the New Zealand shooter being engineered by the Jews. You know, I realized, okay, you know, these people are real, and they're willing to take their beliefs to praxis. And then seeing this guy in New Zealand, and he's not the only one. I just picked out two examples, but you know, he it was an absolute. Uh, he absolutely represented that online culture of the so ironic that do you know if anything is really here behind this person, and. He's all turned that sort of way of expression, that nihilistic way of expression, into his identity. And, uh, you know, that's very... He basically took Christianity and the symbols and signs, which have great meaning in themselves, he hollowed them out for the purposes of creating a racial identity. And then he couldn't even really embrace that completely because he couldn't bring himself to believe even in that. So in the end, he had to refer to the things that he saw on like 8chan and things like that. So, and, you know, does he, I guess he does believe it because he went and he brought his beliefs to praxis. But what he believes, I think that the ideology is nihilism and desperation. It's not something familiar from the past. Like, I can't just say it's fascism. Uh, you can't dig in historical texts, uh, you know, from the Battle of Vienna or wherever that he's referring to and see a direct continuity, something very modern. And I think it's a product of uh, the crises of meaning and identity that people are having far beyond the ones who actually grab news headlines by killing people. Let's take a break for a few minutes and we'll be back with more Holy Wars. And we're back. Uh, this is Holy Wars with Jeremy McClellan. My guest today is Murtaza Hussein. You know, you bring up the Pittsburgh shooting, and one of the motivations behind the shooting uh, at, the, at the synagogue in Pittsburgh was this conspiracy theory that Jews are behind the importation of Muslims. And this is, uh, there's a wide variety of, of these kind of theories, but they, they, they all go under the umbrella of um, what's known as the Great Replacement. Uh, this idea that sort of um, uh, European Christian civilization or American Christianity, um, like, and it's always, you know, wrapped up in being white as well, um, that, that we are being replaced by, um, by North Africans, by people from the Middle East, people from Pakistan, whatever. And um, that this is, so there's this theory that, that, that this is happening. Um, and there's this kind of theory of the dynamic that this is happening. Um, and this goes along with the decline in, in religiosity among Christians, uh, a lot of churches closing, um, and then Muslims being able to retain that. And then so you have all these churches being turned into mosques and people freaking out about that. Um, and so, but, but there's also the conspiracy part, which is that this is somehow being orchestrated, that this is an intentional uh, design by... Uh, the UN by globalists by you know Jews uh, to, to to do this um, and and this is a process this is not just some fringe conspiracy theory this is something and you talk about this that that a lot of people believe um, that a uh, and 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 say like as politicians and people in the media um, so I don't know if you could talk more about that you know I, I think that one thing that people need to grapple with especially in Western countries which uh, typically the, the elites in Western countries are very self-laudatory and they are very judgmental of developing countries, oftentimes rightly so, for failing to educate their populations to a certain level. They consider other countries to be, you know, maybe a thin elite holding back a bunch of people who have not been properly inculcated into the ways of civilization, quote unquote. But I also feel that, you know, there's a very poorly educated electorate in the United States and uh, in Europe and Australia and Canada that we weren't hearing before. But now we are hearing through because they have a voice, social media, and they're also really making themselves known through politics by making outlandish decisions electing outlandish candidates to office mm -hmm. and 
if you do not educate people with a story of who they are and where they came from and history, people need a sense of history, they will find it themselves and they'll look wherever they can get it and they will most likely gravitate towards the most uh, emotional emotional story, the most emotional uh, alarming story because human nature is sort of uh, geared towards that. So in a way it's sort of a titillating idea that you know there's a conspiracy against us and if there's a conspiracy that means we're very important and you know grand actions may be necessary which befit the sense of importance that I feel should weigh upon myself. And this idea has been propagated by people who in their own way on the internet they have a YouTube channel and they have been able to gain a sense of authority uh, with the common public who's not able to discern legitimate knowledge and scholarship from you know charlatan or um, you know illegitimate forms of knowledge and I feel part of this is specialists and elites have spent years talking only to each other mm. academics they tend to, I, it's baffling to me but they've devised a specialist language in many cases that is deliberately impenetrable to the public. And But the public needs historians who can give them a sense of where they came from. Otherwise, these other, you know, popularizers of racial theories and so forth, they will fill that void. And they are filling that void. And one person can be a broadcasting agency now. They can, whereas before you had to have the resources of CNN to do a television broadcast. Alex Jones does it on a very regular basis, and he's just one of many. So, you know, I think that this is just, uh, there are people who are filling a serious void that exists in society that individuals have, and I think it's an epistemological crisis, and I think that, in a way, it's brought a lot of issues to the fore and given us a more clear picture of what our societies are like. And I think it's important for those of us who would like to prevent some calamity in the future, would like to keep together the threads of a social fabric, which are very, history shows are very, you know, they can be, they're very vulnerable to threat. Uh, we have to push back against the toxic narratives and give a more accurate and more constructive narrative that people can hold on to and feel has meaning for them. One of the things that, that I uh, have, have noticed and because like this is such a common um, belief and, and, and as far as the great replacement and uh, which is sort of also known as white genocide. Um, and is, is that if it was true, I mean, if it were true that, that white people, I mean, and it is true that, that white people aren't having as many babies as they used to. Um, and, uh, that because of the opioid epidemic and a lot of deaths of despair um, now for the first time in the United States, uh, white uh, deaths are uh, more than white births. Um, and th that's a very new thing. And that's, I think, like a cause of a lot of uh, people freaking out. And um, I mean, obviously, that's not a good thing, I don't think. Um, not because of some like fetish for the white race, but because of like it's bad that people are losing hope and and having all these deaths. Um, is 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 the response to it that I've noticed is that they they don't respond to like churches closing by um, by like encouraging piety um, right. or by trying to get people like to go to church or like, I, I remember like my friend Sultan, he, and I have all these you know, jokes about it in my sets that uh, he's, he's got a, like his church in, in McLean, Virginia, not his church, his mosque um, is inside of an old Baptist church. And basically the Baptists stopped going to the church and they got down to like two people and they were like, you know, we don't have any, uh, we, you know, we can't afford to keep this place open. And so they, they put it up for sale and the Muslims were like, we'll buy it. And so they, they bought it and uh, it's now a mosque. And at the town hall meetings uh, for the sale of this, uh, they, there were lots of people there protesting the sale of this mosque to the church or, you know, the sale of this church to the mosque. And it was like, you know, if you had come on Sundays 
like w- like we wouldn't be having this problem <laughs> like, right, you know right. like and but it's never that's never the case and it's also never like i mean it's rarely the case that any of the people i mean that i've seen who are so concerned about white genocide have a lot mm-hmm. of kids it's it's usually right, right. You know, and I was just joking that we should have like occupational licensing for white supremacists that like you have to have at least like eight children in order to in order to be a white supremacist. Otherwise, like you don't get to say anything. Uh, But but like with this uh, and you you even had a tweet about about this, about um, the people who are were were freaking out about seeing people on the subway in. Um, I think was it like was it uh, what, what, like was it was it Douglas Murray that was um, his yeah, book, his book The Death Murray. of Europe where he was uh, freaking out that there were all these I guess invaders on the on the subway in France. Yeah, he he's more much more cultured. He didn't use the term invaders, but that was basically the gist of the the book in that passage that he was disturbed by seeing taking a certain line outside of Paris and seeing the number of uh, African uh, and North African, Sub-Saharan African and North African uh, people of descent. Look, and the thing is, like, if you want to attend a church, it's not that the government is giving the churches to Muslims against the will of people and licensing that white people can only have, right. you know, a below birth rate. It's really a choice that people are making. And I, the thing is, there are things that the government can do to make it easier to have a family. And that would benefit people of all races. And, you know, this guy in his manifesto, he is so interested in Christian iconography Mm -hmm. and uh, these historical events which have been decontextualized. And he clearly has gotten from Reddit rather than a history book, which puts it all in context for him. There is this void uh, that people are trying to fill. And, you know, I feel that this opioid crisis, it's a really stark manifestation of this. And I mm-hmm. think that it's something we should all feel very pained about because these are human beings, more so than uh, any race or uh, religious background or lack thereof. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are people who clearly, despite having a higher degree of material well-being than most people in history, um, for things we tend to take for granted now, but they are real, they see a completely hopeless life ahead of them. And uh, they're numbing themselves with drugs and they're, you know, they're responding very self-destructively. And I think that this is the core issue, this nihilistic uh, sense, which is so prevalent among so many people. How do we address that and give people a sense of meaning? And my own personal bias is that, you know, this guy, for instance, even in the manifesto, for all his work, he couldn't bring himself to believe in Christianity. He just couldn't say, I'm a Christian. He just, the most he could say is it's complicated. Right. It was actually, strange. It's not, it was a strange, strange thing. Like, it was, it, it was a strange they word make it seem, there. Yeah, if they make it seem like it's a completely impossible thing to believe in, and like, I can never go down that road again. Mm. But is that really true? Like, it's not really true. And I think people, you know, I would say that a lot of my knowledge just about philosophy and uh, questions I was having growing up, a lot of them were answered by reading uh, you know, people like David Bentley Hart mm-hmm. because I feel that you know, the, there's a very rich philosophical and metaphysical tradition here uh, for people who grew up in the West, whether they're Christian or not. And these people who are lack so, lack so much meaning, they devolve into various forms of nihilism. I think it's because they're not educated in their own tradition. And I find a lot of Muslims are not educated in their tradition either. And they also, you know, choose certain forms of nihilism for that reason. But if we were all to go back and uh, study the basis of how we came to be where we are and who we are and uh, made an effort at it, we'd see that, you know, the situation is not so hopeless. The world is not so meaningless. Mm. And this is actually intellectually defensible and even productive and constructive thing to look into. And we wouldn't have to look to violence against the other or uh, drugs or various other forms of uh, self-destructive catharsis. You know, there is something to live for. And I think that that's the message people need to hold on to. Yeah, one thing that, that I 
that I come up against a lot is is the idea of losing your narrative. Um, and I think about this in my own life, just when when like tragedy happens or when something happens in my own life, um, like you know, in the past when I've like gotten dumped, right? Like you're you're you have you have this image, you have this story that you have of your life, and you think it's going to go one way, um, and and then you get dumped, and you're like, oh no, like everything just falls apart. And you've lost your past because you, you now have to reinterpret the relationship that you were in. Uh, and you, you, you feel like you don't have a future. And there's just this brief, you know, hopefully brief period of hopelessness that you have. And I think for, you know, speaking on behalf of the white community, I always wanted to say that, uh, that there is a, I think, a sense that the story that, that white people have had for a very long time is, uh, has been structured by white supremacy, has been uh, this you know, superiority over other races. And um, we have these, these heroes uh, that we've had throughout history. Um, and uh, we have like a people, whatever. And uh, y- you see this kind of um, collapse, not necessarily like complete, but of, of white supremacy where whites are not uh, superior. Instead, we're uh, we have all these Asian people who are the who are the valedictorians now in our in our schools, and uh, which you know it's what like, I don't care, but it's it's there's this uh, like oh okay, and then now you have the opioid epidemic, and suddenly like oh we're drug addicts as well. We can't just blame that on other races, and we uh, you see a lot of these people who you had held up as heroes, their statues are getting you know taken <laughs> down. And you have this, I guess, collapse of that narrative that you've had for so long. And then what do you replace it with? Like, what's the, what's the narrative uh, that you have? Like, or is, like, d- d- does it just make no sense to have a narrative based on being white? Since whiteness is this construct that's based actually on supremacy and uh, is, is actually constructed uh, because of the dissolution of these other ethnicities like scottish like i'm supposedly scottish i have no idea what that means um because you know go 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 far back i have no idea who my ancestors were um instead i'm just white whatever that means um and the narrative of whiteness in america is is changing so fast and so like what do you i i see a lot of white people who uh they like there is this kind of sense that like okay well i i like i don't really have a culture per se um, and it's sort of an, it's sort of a common joke that white people don't have culture. Um, and so you're like, okay, well, and I, and you're not supposed to like borrow from other cultures cause that's appropriation. So like, all right, so like, what am I supposed to do? Um, and like that, I think that there's this very deep nihilism that is taking place. Um, and I sort of see the alt right as this, like trying, it's, it's almost like a post-colonial, like movement among white people, like even though obviously like the, the like the colonization is, is constructed and we blame it on, you know, white people blame it on Jews or whatever. That's sort of as far as the like feeling colonized for some reason. Um, but but there's this kind of uh, sense of trying to reclaim this and this, you know, through these bizarre symbols that have no connection to history. Um, and it, it's a very strange place to be. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, I, I totally understand. It's a very, people need a history and they need an identity. And uh, it's not really possible to live without an identity. It's just that how do we create an identity which is constructive and uh, which gives people a sense of meaning, but not, doesn't necessarily set them against other people. Mm. Uh, yeah, and you have like, th- th- there's, there's like several <laughs> options. So you can, you can go for race. Uh, which is like historically not a very good idea um, to to uh, you know like hitch on to as far as your primary identity. You can go for religion, which I'm a fan of as a religious person, um, and uh, that has you know downsides as well. But um, in terms of you know making you hate other people, um, or you can go for like nationalism uh, and having a strong national identity, but. I mean, um, um, American national identity is incredibly contested, to say the least, as far as what that means. Um, and so I don't know. It's it's all yeah. up for air. it's all up for grabs. 
You know, I find that a lot of people, uh, what they do and have done, especially in the United States where there's a very loud democratic culture, is that they take that void and try to put all the weight of it onto politics. Mm. So their political identity becomes that surrogate identity, which is going to provide them meaning and going to provide them a sense of existential purpose. And the politicians, for their part, they egg that sentiment on mm. because, you know, Barack Obama, for instance, I think he was a technocrat manager, but he positioned himself as though he was like almost like a prophet. He speaks in such transcendental terms as though he could deliver the country to, you know, something far beyond we'd expect from just a manager of society. And he's not the only one. He's just one particularly evocative example. But I see Beto O'Rourke uh, is a very uh, strident example of this today. They all do it. Because actually, if you didn't speak like that, if you didn't speak as though somehow, if we get the politics right, we can turn this place into, we can turn your life into a paradise or something like that. Yeah, you know? there, there, there was a um, an article I, I remember reading about during the election where it was called there was actually a movement called like make yourself great again. And it was, uh, people who had found their, especially young men who had found their, uh, support of Trump, like getting their life together basically. And it was, it was tied up with, I think the, like the, like the Jordan Peterson phenomenon where, mm -hmm. um, sort of like being a red blooded man and, you know, this reinvigorated masculinity, like, okay, like get your life in order. And there's some, I guess there's some good to that. Uh, at least, at least people who like Jordan Peterson clean their rooms and, uh, you know, think, make their bed in the morning, which is good. Um, but, but I remember you talking about, uh, people putting bigger demands on politics. You had that interview that you did um, in The Intercept with uh, Martin Gurry, um, right. who wrote The um, the Revolt of the Public. Um, right. And it was it was about this uh, this phenomenon of the of the like you mentioned earlier, this switch of power from the mass or from the the gatekeepers to the masses. Right. Where. Yeah, exactly. yeah go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, I mean, like, if you could just, uh, like... Oh, right, explain. Yeah, well, you know, I find it really funny, and I find it, for me, quite edifying, uh, because, like, I certainly would not be a public voice in any capacity were the old model to be in place, which is, you know, every city has a newspaper, there's mm -hmm. two, three news channels... All the journalists know each other. They probably went to school together. And if you want to have any broadcast, you have to go through their gates and uh, basically, for the most part, be homogenized according to their uh, prerequisites. And, you know, that really created a very small and narrow band of discourse. The things that were actually reported are much nar were much narrower than now. You know, we're getting to the point where almost anything in the world can be documented with a cell phone camera. And we're nearing one giant web of information, right. whereas before, you know, they would describe the newspaper as everything that happened, but it was just a tiny fraction that was chosen to be reported for whatever reason. Yeah, I, I used to have a bit about the, the, like the TV show Cops, where they would mm -hmm. follow cops around and record the whole thing, and just like whose job it was to edit that, apparently... <laughs> Because, because like, we watched cops on television every day for years. And we're like, this is definitely what being a cop is like. And then they invented cameras on your phones. And, like, and it was just this flood of brutality. And we're like, you know, maybe that wasn't the case. You know, I feel so bad because look, look at the Trayvon Martin case, which I think was really, that wasn't caught on video, but it was an example of uh, social media sort of raising the alarm about something mm -hmm. that people have been said was going on for a very long time, but there wasn't really a lot of sense. You know, there was a lot of pushback and, you know, how could the cops do that? Or the newspaper didn't say it, so, you know, I've never seen that before. But now people are having documentary evidence of something they've been saying for a long time on cell phone cameras. Uh, there was another shooting of, I can't remember where it happened in the U.S., but a guy who was literally running away from a cop and shot in the back. That was about uh, uh, 
a mile away from where I am right now. That was um, I was wondering in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. that was a, that um, was in North Charleston, uh, where Michael Slager, um, uh, Michael Slager, exactly, yeah, uh, was the cop, and he um, he was found guilty. But um, uh, I have no doubt in mind that that had someone had come forward with that news before the cell phone camera era, they would not have been believed. They would be like, mm -hmm. "This is crazy." The cop is saying something else. Our cops not going around shooting people in the back. Right. That's just outlandish. You know, maybe we'll arrest you. But now we're in a new, like, there's been a diffusion of voices, which I think is good, and it certainly benefits uh, people who were not elites. Having said that, I think it's also created a sense of epistemological chaos, mm. because people don't know who to point to as an authority, or there is a shuffling going on right now. And some people have, you know, they pitched their wagons to very bizarre sources of information, like the Prison Planet guy, or Infowars, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, left-wing equivalents of that. Uh, there have uh, it's really, you know, there's a lot of confusion. And sometimes I like to read the New York Times just because it's sort of like it's a little less chaotic, and I feel a sense that I have a handle on what's going on in the world. It's an illusory handle, mm -hmm. but you know, the newspaper is a very underrated. It was a very underrated tool for giving people a sense of what's going on, or, or at least the idea that they had an idea of what's going on in the world. I used to wake up every day when I was a kid and read the Toronto Star, very, like, page to page, and I'd feel like I'm prepared to understand what's going on in the world, and if I meet somebody, they probably read the same thing as me, and we can have a conversation based on shared reality. Now, there's so many different realities. Uh, it's quite chaotic. It can breed great degree of confusion, and it can breed uh, these bubbles where people living and walking in the same streets can have a completely different sense of what's going on. They can have an optimistic sense, or relatively optimistic, or they can walk down the street and think, you know, I'm living in a post-apocalypse that the invaders have conquered already, and right. uh, you know, when is the counter-colonial movement going to start? We'll be right back with more Holy Wars. And we're back. The, uh, and I, I think one thing you've, you're, you're, you're seeing is that this is not just happening in politics, it's happening in religion. Um, and of course, these, these, these categories of religion and politics are, are, are messy, but uh, that you have, like among Catholics, there was this idea that by democratizing um, the church somewhat, that you would end up with uh, like you know, back, back in the sixties, this was the hope for like liberal Catholicism was that, um, you know, more power to the people. And, uh, then, you know, let's, 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 you know, devolve power away and, and, uh, and this would be great. Um, but now you're in this situation where, I mean, uh, like my friend Patrick and I were joking yesterday about how you can tell how Catholic someone is by like, 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 you know, someone is super Catholic when they hate the Pope. Like, and, and how weird of a situation that is, like, that has not happened in 2000 years. Like, but now if someone's like, I really hate the Pope, they're either an atheist or extremely Catholic. And, <laughs> and like, and I mean, you have, I mean, this is true, like, not least among, you know, about immigration in, in Europe, where the Pope is, is, while he's not open borders, he's, you know, he, he supports, you know, being kind to, to, to refugees and not demonizing people. And he was critical of Trump's wall. And, and, uh, and then you have these sort of like a populist movement among Catholics who are uh, pining for the days of Christendom. Um, and they're doing it by trashing the Pope. And <clears throat> it's sort of this strange situation where I'm like, you know... And I lean traditional as far as being a Catholic goes, but I'm like, if if this were Christendom, you wouldn't be allowed to say that, like a, like about right. I, I you know like, you have to if if your big dream is that everyone will submit to the Pope, why don't you start now, um, <laughs> and and welcome these refugees? I don't know. It's uh, it's it's really strange, and you saw this with the response to the, you know when when the Pope went to the um uh went to dubai um and uh for the um just like a few a few weeks ago or a month ago he was there and signed <laughs> s signed this thing with the um the like the shake there and 
people were so critical of, of, of him going there. And, and uh, it, it, but it was, it was people who in a previous era just wouldn't be allowed to publish that stuff um, mm -hmm. because the Pope would have said, don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's so ironic because uh, it's the similar dynamic playing out uh, among, on the Muslim side in the Muslim world is because there has been a, also a democratization of religion uh, in the sense that, you know, for instance, the Pope, when he was in Dubai, I believe he met the Sheikh Al-Azhar, mm -hmm. which yes. is a, typically a very prestigious position in Sunni Islam. Uh, it's part of the establishment of Islam. It's like, it, the Islam does not have a, a papacy, but it has, you know, institutions which are very mm -hmm. respected historically, and the knowledge they generated is, was considered legitimate. Uh, in the last, you know, you could say 60, 70 years, especially in the Arab world, but not exclusively, those institutions have come under great assault by, you know, revolutionary movements and then populist movements. The Muslim Brotherhood is an example of one of those. Uh, and they've been slowly hollowed out of their legitimacy. So as you're saying, people are attacking the Pope to show how Christian they are. You could show you're really Muslim by saying that, you know, I really reject uh, the traditional Islamic establishment. Mm -hmm. And the traditional Islamic establishment is the one that would be glad to embrace the Pope because they're looking at things in terms of a longer history. Uh, and they may make serious moral compromises with bad governments or cruel governments, as I think they do in Egypt. But... Uh, they're not uh, Jacobins. They're right. very much, uh, yeah, they're part of that. And the Pope also is not Jacobin. The Pope is, he also looks at things in the term for broader history of Muslims and Christians have with each other. And the thing is, it's very hard because in some sense, when people are angry at an establishment, they truly have some reason to be angry. There's usually some sort of corruption that they're revolting against. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they are just have populist sentiments, which are not constructive or legitimate, uh, but, you know, it's not always black and white, that there's one good side and one bad side. And But I think that, you know, as literacy in the world has reached a level which has never been at before, uh, it's in rising every year, people's ability to communicate with each other is definitely reached a revolutionarily unprecedented level. Uh, you're going to see different ideas ferment. Uh, people are going to be more or sorry, less uh, likely to uh, revere or submit to the dictates of any form of authority, regardless of what, whether what they're saying is good or bad in some cases. They just have more opportunity to question them. And people in authority are going to be less able to control the stories that they tell about themselves. So, you know, if you don't like the Pope and you have some lingering doubts about, you know, what is this Pope in Dubai doing? You can read like 20 different articles probably, reinforcing that belief, giving you reasons to build on that belief. And, you know, before you know it, maybe you're not uh, looking at the institutions which, as you said, 200 years ago, you would have unquestionably followed. Maybe you would be in revolt against them. And maybe even the thing you would replace it with would not be as good uh, because it's hard to replace something that's been built over thousands of years. Right. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a daunting task. And usually... To go back to the beginning we're talking about, when you do try to destroy an establishment, uh, the place you start from is much worse, and maybe you never get back to where you would like to be. Yeah. It's something to think of. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about, um, the, like you said um, before, about you know walking down the street and how um, you and the other person could be in totally different uh, worlds and see totally different things. And I, I've, I've long sort of thought about this, that, that with... Um, like, like back in the day, I mean, especially how religion works, and this is true, like with a lot of, um, a, like a lot of radicalized Muslims who, uh, don't, who don't go to mosque, right. Or a lot of these Christian, you know, terrorists who, uh, are actually don't like believe anything is that when you are like devout and you do go to a uh, mosque or you go to church every week, um, if you have a weird thought and you express it, it gets shaved off pretty quickly. Like if you go to Bible study and say something about Mary being the fourth person of the Trinity, like I, that's just something that I made up. But like, 
you know, if, if you were to have that idea, you'd get shut down pretty quickly. Um, like people would say that's nonsense or whatever. Um, now, if you were to go and Google that, you'll find people who believe that. Mm -hmm. And they'll be scattered all over the world, but maybe it's a hundred of them on a, on a Facebook group. And suddenly you have like a community of people who then can reinforce that belief. And suddenly like you're this insurgency and you can just go down this rabbit hole and you, and then you might still go to church sometimes or whatever, but you'll have that in the back of your mind. Like they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and like, it's, it's just, so you can have people who are walking around who are, completely like ha like in a totally different world um and but but that goes back to the, the like like the revolt of the public where how do you even begin to 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 address that uh, it's very difficult and i mean i don't foresee that people are going to go back to the way they were at some previous time and in many cases they have good reasons to because uh, there's a reason also people are dissatisfied with uh, institutions around the world, including religious institutions. Uh, I, I also don't think that we can persist in, indefinitely uh, in a state of revolt, as the book said as well. I don't think that you know this sort of chaotic uh, environment epistemologically and politically is sustainable. And I think we live in very complex societies, unprecedentedly complex societies, that you know they're very vulnerable and and it's happening so fast that if you have you have people who arise as these new leaders who then get you know yanked down within a week uh you know they, they were once the 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 insurgents and within a week they're the establishment um and it's just uh, yeah like you said it's not sustainable yeah i'm quite concerned actually like uh who knows where things are going but i do feel that until people settle in the settle on some sort of uh, modus vivendi that they can be okay with. And I think there are some uh, people out there who are articulating a way that could happen. Uh, it's going to be a lot of turbulence. And, you know, there are times in history where there have been turbulence before different establishments that people are content with settle into place. And those have often been very violent uh, or uh, dangerous times. And look, the world we live in today, there are serious global problems and they require global solutions uh, we can't persist in a state of permanent con crisis. In the United States, I think the United States is in a political crisis. So is the UK. Mm. Uh, and it's partly due to our political system, the electoral system. If another model of a country comes along, which is many ways more brutal and less free and I would say inferior, like the Chinese model, and but they don't have electoral, electoral electorally driven crises every four years, you know, that could be the dominant model. And, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. What, one, one thing that I'm really interested in and uh, that is sort of the basis for this podcast is that um, the, like the dominant model for pluralism um, for the last, you know, uh, 150, 200 something years um, has been has been liberalism. That uh, that the liberal sort of um, centrist model um, has uh, that that's how we how we will get along, that we will bracket off these religious beliefs that we have um these sort of thick um understanding of the good and we will sort of enter into uh and there's different models of, of liberalism but one thing i think you're seeing is that the the liberal model is kind of breaking down and people are becoming very suspicious of it um and there's uh like you you see people who are um who who really want their you know their thick beliefs about the good to be fully informing their politics and not just this kind of appendage or private or spiritualized <clears throat> set of beliefs. Um, so what is I guess I guess the central question that I have um, that I'm exploring is what is the model for pluralism after liberalism? You know, if someone can answer that question, that would be if this podcast can answer that question. That would be a very valuable contribution because I think a lot of people who are attuned to the fact that the liberal establishment that we all grew up used to is staggering under very serious blows, uh, if they can think of a way of 
transitioning out of it that does not require a violent and uh, counterproductive sort of change, a jarring change, uh, that would be very beneficial. And I, I think that the answer has to be organically building local communities from the bottom down rather than asking politics to change things from the top down or trying to uh, enforce a revolutionary change through politics. I think that um, the way it can happen is that, you know, if there are people in the United States that the the way this country is governed is so uh, antithetical to their version of the good, they should be allowed within reason and within a certain framework of uh, morality to live according to their sense of the good locally as long as it's not uh, infringing on others' rights. Uh, and I guess this is the dream of the, theoretically the dream of what liberalism should entail, but it really hasn't. It really has enforced its own version of the good on people. Mm. Uh, how can we devolve power and authority uh, to where people really live, which is in their local communities? And I think that the polarizing environment in the United States right now, it maybe have a silver lining because you're seeing cities, uh, and I think cities are really a very durable and long-lasting form of social organization. And to some degree, states also, uh, they are asserting, to the extent they can, their own prerogatives to define what looks like a just society locally. And the more that we can do that, I think the more that an alternative may arise organically rather than us having to sit down and think one up. Murtaza Hussein, thank you so much for joining me and uh, for being my guest. And... Uh... This was truly an honor and a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And that concludes our very first episode of Holy Wars. Uh, I want to thank Murtaza for being my first guest. And for everyone who listened, thank you guys so much. Uh, please subscribe, share this, give feedback, and subscribe to my Patreon, where you can support this project for a monthly donation of just $1 or $5 or $10 a month, whatever you feel uh, in your heart is, 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 is what you should do. Uh, that would go a long way to helping me keep production values high and, most importantly, buy diapers for my daughter. Uh, thank you guys very much.